Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? It is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. Welcome to Thrive. We are so happy to have you here with us today at all of our campuses, Torrington, New Britain, Terryville, online, on TV, wherever you are, we welcome you. My name is Judah Thomas. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are in our series called Wind Chasers, and, and this is a series on the book of Ecclesiastes, which is, is a, a book of wisdom, but it's all about the meaning of life and sometimes how life can feel a little bit meaningless from time to time, how it's, how it's like chasing the wind, that we're, we're, we're pursuing these things, and, and sometimes we get the things that we're chasing and we find out that it isn't all that we had hoped for. We talked about the seasons of life and contentment. And, and, and this week, you know, as we're diving into this, now, first off, this book of Ecclesiastes tends to be a little bit more on the downside. Like, it's a different tone than a lot of the other books in the Bible. Like, a lot of them are very, very positive and uplifting. This one's kind of like a little bit more down, but we are going to new depths today as we're talking about our favorite topic, death, okay? So if you've come for a very uplifting service, well, hopefully it'll still be there, but it's gonna get a little bit uh, depressing. Maybe, maybe not, we'll see, you know? If you're driving and you see a church building, not, maybe not a church like ours, right? Uh, but, but a church with like a, a big steeple on top and the stained glass windows and spires. It looks like a th- cathedral. What do you think about when you see a church like that? A lot of times you'll think about maybe Sunday services or something like that. But, but it, it, think about the other times that you would attend a building, a church like that. What other events would it be? Maybe, maybe a wedding or a funeral, Right? We go, go to, to weddings and we go to funerals, but funerals are, are something that we often, you know, we, we maybe don't go into church for any other reason, but when this happens, we end up there, we end up grieving, we end up in these situations. Now, I've had uh, uh, the opportunity to perform dozens and dozens of funerals over the year, and, and it's, it's never something that's very easy, but it's, it's a time where people are coming to face-to-face with death with their mortality, with the end of life. I heard of a pastor, and, and he was doing a, a sermon, uh, a funeral. I think it was his first funeral ever. And, and he had the, the person uh, there in the, in the casket in the front. And, and as he's talking about this, he's just like so nervous that he's going to mess something up. And he just says, remember that, that, that uh, this body you see here is only a shell. The nut has gone to heaven, you know. Um, it, you know, we, we can say silly things like that. You know, I've had the privilege of being able to spend uh, the last moments of people's lives, you know, as they're preparing to enter into eternity, to be with them, to pray with them, to, to make sure that they're right with God. I've even had the opportunity to plan funerals with people before they died. You know, it's, it's a little bit morbid. The first time they had it, I'm like, I don't know, this is a little bit weird planning something like this. But they, they had ideas of how they wanted their life to be remembered and how they wanted people to, to celebrate their life. Heard of a, a florist who um, ended up getting a, a mix-up. Somebody was sending some flowers and and this, this uh, uh, guy sent some flowers to a friend who just opened up a new business uh, in a new location, and, and he got the flowers, and it just said, rest in peace. And the guy that sent the flowers was like, oh, man, like what happened? He called the floor. He said, you know, I'm so frustrated. You sent this set of flowers that said, rest in peace. He said, well, yeah, that's pretty bad. He says, but think about the funeral who got the one that says, good luck with your new location, you know? <laughs> See, funerals are something that sometimes we don't like to think about. Like, what's the point of a funeral, right? We, we have these funerals, and, and it's a time that it kind of draws us together where we remember a loved one, but, but we also come face to face with our own mortality. We begin to realize, perhaps, no matter how you've lived your life, you begin to realize that God is unavoidable, that you will, in fact, face eternity. So the scripture says that all of us have an appointment and we all will, will face eternity at some point in time. And at a funeral, we face these things together. We face the fact that we all have a limited 
amount of time here on this earth. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1, it says, A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. And the day you die is better than the day you are born. Underline that sentence there. I mean, isn't that kind of a, a crazy sentence? Like, we don't, we don't normally think like that. If I said, what's better, the day you're born or the day you're, you die, most of us would think the day that we're born is better. But here, the author in Ecclesiastes says, and the day that you die is better than the day you're born. It's better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. I don't know if you've ever just gone to a funeral home just to hang out for a while. You know, he says here, it's better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. So the living, that's us, should take this to heart. So sorrow is better than laughter. For sadness has, has a refining influence on us. Sadness has a refining influence. It says that sorrow is better than laughter. In, in your notes, if you're taking them, sorrow shapes us more than happiness does. Have you ever noticed that? Like you can have happy times and, and good times in life, but, but very rarely do those shape us on a deep and a meaningful level. But the sorrows that we go through, those are the things that shape us that make us into who God wants us to be. The most basic thing about life is that it ultimately comes to an end. Death. And it haunts us. And we don't like to talk about it. We're like, we, we, we don't even like to think about it. We don't like to talk about it. Like we don't, there, there's things that we don't like to talk about, right? We don't like to talk about, about maybe politics. We don't like to talk about religion. We don't like to talk about death. But, but, but ultimately, it's the great equalizer. It's the great equalizer. It's something that, that all of us inevitably will face at some point in time. You're like, wow, this is so uplifting, right? You ever notice that? It seems like the good die young. Death comes to us all, and, and, and it just doesn't seem fair sometimes. It, it doesn't seem fair how, how someone who's, who's evil ends up outliving people that we love and we cherish. And it just doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. See, Ecclesiastes, and one of the reasons why I love Ecclesiastes is because it doesn't shy away from these things. It just jumps right in and just, just stirs it up and it reminds us that regardless of our status, regardless of our income, regardless of, of, of the things that we've accomplished in life, regardless of, of our achievements, regardless of our possessions, we all face the same end. When I was younger, there was a, a, a line of clothing out there called No Fear. I don't know if you guys remember No Fear gear. Like, some of you are old enough. Some of you have no clue. It's okay. It was kind of a weird time in our history. But, but they would have these funny sayings on them. And one of the sayings on the No Fear shirts was, he who dies with the most toys wins. Like, really? Like, how, how do you figure that? You know, out of all of the funerals that I've done, I've never once, I've never once seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul truck with all the person's belongings. Like, what are you, oh, we're just gonna bury it with them because they wanted to, I mean, that, that's what many of the ancient Egyptians would do in, in, their, in their pyramids. They would they'd be buried with all of their possessions thinking that somehow they could uh, access it in the afterlife. It's like there was a wealthy person and he was wealthy, but, but not only was he wealthy, he was stingy. Stingy, and, and he'd worked hard for, for his money and he did not want to leave it to anyone. He didn't want to leave it to his wife, didn't want to leave it to his kids, didn't want to leave it to anyone, and everybody knew very well. And he said, when I die, I want you to bury all of my money with me in my casket. Everybody knew this. And eventually, you know, as time had it, he did pass away. And as they're having the funeral, everybody's like wondering what this widow is going to do. And somebody comes up and says, you know, I know that, that he, he wanted to be buried with all of his money, all of his possessions. D did you do it? She says, yes, absolutely. She says, I wrote him a check, and if he decides to cash it, he can have it all. <laughs> See, we can't bring it with us. We can't bring it with us. See, although this seems kind of maybe down and, and depressing at times, there's a profound message of hope and purpose here that we all need to grasp because we're all on the same journey together. And it's the most important thing for us to grasp and to understand. It says in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 2, it says, The same destiny ultimately awaits everyone. The same destiny. We all will face death, some sooner than others. But it says, The same destiny ultimately awaits everyone, whether righteous or wicked, whether good or bad whether ceremonially clean or unclean, whether religious 
or irreligious. Good people receive the same treatment as sinners, and people who make promises to God are treated like people who don't. It seems so tragic that everyone under the sun suffers the same fate. That's why people are not more careful to do good. Instead, they choose their own mad course because they have no hope. There's nothing ahead but death anyway. It's hope only for the living. As they say, it's better to be a live dog than a dead lion. I don't know who says that, but... So what they're saying here is that, is that you know, it's, it's kind of all pointless. At least that's what, what this writer is taking from it. It's all pointless, like, like you can get a lot of money or a little, and we both have the same fate. You can be good or bad, and you all have the same fate. In your notes, life is unstable, and death is une- inevitable. You know, it's uh, the instability of life. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but, but death is inevitable. No one ever gets out alive. No one gets out alive. Now, I'm sure you've went to the store and bought some, I got some chocolate milk. I just grabbed this out of the, the fridge in the back. And, uh, and, and printed on the side of it has an expiration date. This one happens to be March 17th, 2024. That's only a few days away. Now, the thing of it is, I don't know how long this has been open. So let, let's see. I can't tell if this is good or not. I'm not going to drink it, okay? Because, see, I have a problem. You know the problem that I have? I mean, I have more than one problem, I'm sure. But, um, but, but one is that I have a hard time tasting if something is not good or not. I don't know why that is. It, it, it's a bad problem. In fact, I'll tell you. Uh, once, when I was younger, I decided I was going to go and I was going to get a cold-cut sandwich. And I got this cold-cut sandwich, and, and it was from an Italian deli. And I start eating it, and I'm eating it. I'm, I'm fine. I'm enjoying the sandwich. It's tasting pretty good. I mean, I eat half the sandwich, and then I get this whiff of something. I'm like, what is that smell? And I look in there, and like all the meat is like slimy and green. And I'm like, I just ate half of this thing, and I didn't even notice it. So I'm not going to drink this, but you know, it has an expiration date on it. It has an expiration date. In other words, it's saying that, that you know, if you want to consume this after the date, maybe even before, you do this at your own risk. It has an expiration date printed on it. We have an expiration date as well. Ours is not printed on us, and we don't know when it is. But ultimately, we all will face the same fate as each other. We all have, have an appointment. In fact, many of us in our life, we've had near misses. We've had near misses. In fact, I've had several near misses where I've, where I've almost died, where, where something crazy would happen. And God, for whatever reason, spared me. Maybe you've had situations like that. Well, it's because it wasn't your time yet. See, we all have an appointment. We all have an appointment that we'll keep. Scripture says that life is kind of like a vapor, like fog, like mist, like it's here today and and gone tomorrow. We don't know when it's gonna come. We don't know when it's gonna go. And it's a sobering thought. And many of us, we don't like to think about it. Well, some people like to think about it. Some people like to say, well, well, maybe if I, if I just embrace death and, and, and the movies that I watch and the clothes that I wear and, if I just, and the music that I listen to and all these things, maybe then, then I can get over my fear of it. But no matter how much we try, it, it, it's something that, that we all must face. No matter how much we achieve, no matter how much we accumulate, no matter how much we experience, we all share the same fate. When it's game over, no response, no, no starting over again, no reincarnation. You're not coming back again as a frog or whatever. See, see, here's the thing. We all face the same fate. In Ecclesiastes 6.12, it says, in the few days of our meaningless lives. Isn't that encouraging? Like, some of you guys are like, I wish I didn't come today. That's okay. Um, in the few days of our meaningless lives, who knows how our, best day, our days can best be spent. Our lives are like a shadow. Who can tell what will happen on this earth after we're gone? Now, people don't often like talking about death. They don't like to, to think about it or reflect on, on their life that's ending. And we don't like reminders that our time is, is limited. Think about the mayfly, for example. I, I do a little bit of fly fishing, and, and so as a result, mayflies are something that, that I'm, I'm very uh, interested in, and, and, and they're one of the things that we try to mimic and emulate when we're out there fly fishing, but, but mayflies have the, the shortest lifespan of any creature on this earth. They live about 24 hours. It's the shortest lifespan. Uh, most of their life is spent under the water, and then they, then they emerge, and then they, they get their wings, and some of them only survive for about five minutes in adulthood. That is if a trout doesn't get them on the way up. And, and, and they don't look at life as, 
maybe depressing and unfair. They're just doing what God designed them to do. They serve a very important purpose for spreading nutrients around and and spreading bacteria uh, throughout the waterways and doing all of these things. They have this very short life. Now, we feel a little bit different because we're made in God's image. You know, you don't ever see another species of animal, another, another creature that is contemplating the meaning of life, right? We don't, we don't see our pets contemplating the meaning of life. We don't see animals in the wild thinking like, oh, why am I here? But like, like they know why they're there. They're there to eat, right? They're usually there to eat, to reproduce, and then to die. And that, that's usually the limit. But see, we were made, as Ecclesiastes says, we read this a few weeks back, that we were made with eternity in our hearts. We were made with this, with this feeling that I think there's something more. It can't just be this. It can't just be this, this life that I'm living now. It's like there's something more, and I just don't know exactly what it is. Death looms over us, and we, and we don't know when it may come. We don't know if we're going to last a day or a week or a month or a year. In fact, it's probable that the probabilities are high that in a year from today, there's some of us that won't be here anymore. And that's kind of a sad thought to think about. But here's the thing. We all face it. And if we're going to face it, it's important for us to pay attention to it now. It's important for us to pay attention to how we live our life now. Instead of being locked away in fear. See, death is not something that we should be afraid of and that we should be paralyzed of. Especially when we have our faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. What instead it should do is, in your notes, death should be a motivation for us to use our time effectively. See, see, life is fragile. Like, we don't know what tomorrow holds. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8. He says, I mean, he just starts throwing out scenarios here. Like, here's some ways that you might die, okay? He says, when you dig a well, you might fall in it, okay? When you demolish an old well, you could be bitten by a snake. When when you work in a quarry, stones may fall and crush you. When you chop wood, there's danger with each stroke of your axe. If you've ever split wood, you know that this could be a dangerous thing, right? He said, here's some random ideas of of ways that you can die. And and there's a million others. You don't know what tomorrow has in store. See, the question is not if, but it's when. Did you know in the world, every minute, 104 people die every single minute. That means in the duration of the sermon today, about 3,125 people pass from this life into the next. That's more than died on 9-11 every 30 minutes. Now there's some wealthy people that have decided they're gonna beat this thing. They're gonna figure out how to beat death. People like Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and and the founders of Google, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, they've they've contributed millions and billions even of dollars to prevent death. They've said, this is what one of them said. It says, death doesn't make sense to me. We want to be able to live forever. Like this is literally what they're investing their money. All of these billionaires are investing their money into preventing themselves from dying. The question I have is, do you really want to live forever? Do you really want to live forever? See, see, what is the purpose of death? What is the purpose? We, we read a couple weeks ago in Ecclesiastes 3 that there is a time to be born, but there is also a time to die. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, this is in uh, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. He says, what I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. Did you catch that? See, see, our body cannot inherit God's kingdom. This is, this is a shadow of things to come. Now, this is the best that we know. This life is the best that we know, and it has some good times, and it has some bad times, but this is the best that we know. But God promises that he has an even better place prepared for us. And in your notes, death is God's way of giving you eternal life. For those of us who put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ our Lord, this is not something that we should be fearful of, but something that we should soberly embrace. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54, skipping down a few verses, it says, Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. See, death is swallowed up in victory. He goes on to say, Oh, death! 
Where is your victory? Now, now when I hear this, like, like this is like taunting. Like this is like, oh, death, where's your victory? Hello, where's your victory, death? Come on, we're so afraid of you. Where's your victory? Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God. Why do we thank God? Because it goes on to say he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, we don't need to live in fear. We don't need to live in worry. We don't need to, to, to live terrified of what tomorrow may bring because Jesus has conquered sin and death. Jesus, when he died on the cross, rose again. He beat it once and for all. And God removes the sting. He took the stinger out, just like a honeybee, right? If a honeybee stings, they say that, that they can only sting once because then the days of that honeybee are numbered. That's what, like, what death is. Death, it stung Jesus, but Jesus took the sting out of death. And for us, for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, yes, we may mourn when a loved one goes on to be with him, but not like those who have no hope. This is why it's so important for us to make sure that our lives are right with God and that, that we are a good example and a good witness to those around us so that they can end up putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Because when we know where we are going, there is hope. See, in your notes, even in death, Jesus gives us hope. He gives us hope. There's hope in Jesus Christ. This is what we celebrate at Easter, that, that Jesus once and for all defeated death. We trust that his words are true, that he's prepared a place in eternity for us. And that place is way better than we could ever imagine. That place is way better. Whenever I do a funeral for someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ, now I, I, my heart goes out to the friends and the family, but I'm not sorry for that person one bit because they are standing with God Almighty. They are seeing Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't feel bad for them. They've crossed over into the life that, that God has prepared for them. See, God has prepared a place for each and every one of us. And understanding that life has an expiration date can radically affect and shift our perspective on the life that we live. It prompts us to ask important questions like, what am I living for? Am I investing in things that truly last, or am I only investing for things that make a difference right here and now? It says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus is speaking here. He says, don't store up treasures here on this earth. Where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal, store your treasures in heaven. Where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. See, this is a call for each and every one of us. This is a call for us to prioritize our lives around lasting values. This is a call for us to, to invest in things that have eternal impact. See, see we can't bring all of our belongings to heaven with us, but we can bring friends and family. We can bring other people that we are willing to share our faith with. And knowing that our time here is limited shouldn't lead us to despair, but it should lead us to living purposefully in our life. That we're living life with purpose, with meaning, with intention, making each and every day count. That we're loving deeply, that we're acting justly, that we're, we're walking humbly with our God. In your notes, our legacy isn't in the wealth that we gain, but it's in the difference that we make. See, our legacy is not about the money that we make, not about the, the followers that we get, not about our education or our job or even our contributions to our town and our family and things like that. It's what difference are you making in this life and in this world? What is it that we're really building? See, earthly achievements and recognition, it all fades away, but the love that we share and the kindness that we show to others and the faith that we live out are things that last for an eternity. So Ecclesiastes leads us up to this conclusion, that life is fleeting and death is certain, but the story doesn't end there. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. 
See, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, he gives us the opportunity to be a part of his family, that he's preparing a place in heaven, that we don't need to be afraid of death or dying any longer. We don't need to be afraid of these things any longer. This is an an invitation to the eternal life that only God provides. And this is the promise that even though our bodies may return to dust, that our spirits can live forever with God in heaven. See, the end of life here on earth is not the final word for those who believe, for those who trust in Jesus Christ our Lord. See, it's a transition instead to something far greater and hope can fill our lives and give us peace and give us purpose. The psalmist says, even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. Because God is with us each and every step of the way. For those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Are we calling on him? Are we putting our faith and trust in Jesus? Or are we putting our faith and trust in any other thing? Because it's only through Christ. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. You're not going to get there through good works. You're not going to get there through any uh, following any of the other world religions. And yes, I know that seems exclusive. And it is exclusive, but it's inclusive as well. Because anyone who calls on his name will be saved. So the question that we ask is, how do I use my time and my energy and my talents to make an impact that lasts now? How can I love those and serve those around me in a way that leaves a lasting imprint? See, we've all been given a gift, and the gift is called the present. The present right now, right here, where we are, this is what we have. And what we do with this is what matters most. Are we making a difference to those around us? Have you called on the name of the Lord? And if you are, then he says that he's prepared a place for you, that he's offering you eternal life, that even though we all face death here on this earth, that we will live again. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Scripture says that it's more blessed, that God is blessed when his saints die because they are reunited with him. What we find so hard to understand, God is saying it's not that bad because you're getting to be with me. You're getting to be in the place that I prepare. You're getting to be in eternity. So although we face it, we can face it with joy. We can face it with certainty, knowing that Christ has saved us, forgiven us, and he's taken away the sting of death. Let's pray. God, we come to you now, and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. And we thank you that even in these heavy topics, in these heavy things, the thing that that most of us fear more than anything else, that Jesus Christ, our Lord, has been victorious. He's defeated sin, defeated death, so that we don't need to live in fear any longer. If you're here today, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, you don't know what tomorrow may hold. None of us have tomorrow promised to us. Scripture says that if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and you say with your mouth that he's your Lord, that you'll be saved. If you believe that, won't you call on his name? Don't let another day go by. Won't you call on his name and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. God, we thank you for preparing a place for us We thank you for taking away the sting of death. We thank you that even though we may mourn, we don't have to mourn like those who have no hope because you have given us hope and hope has a name, Jesus Christ our Lord, and that he's forgiven us and he's saved us and he's redeemed us and he's made a place for us in heaven. And Lord, we thank you that you've created this amazing earth for us to live on, but we thank you that you've created an even better place for us and you are waiting there for us and that you will reunite us and we will be with you one day. We'll be with those who have gone on before and we thank you, we praise you for this confidence that we have, that we don't need to live under the spirit of fear, but we can have power, love, and a sound mind because of the sacrifice that Jesus made when he overcame death and the grave once and for all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.